Howdy! I'm your host, Captain Rob Modis. Welcome to Catch Outdoors, presented by the Waypoint Podcast Network at waypointtv.com. Besides doing podcasts, I write books. <laughs> Bridge to Paradise, a book of short stories about travel, fishing, and life in the slow lane is available on Amazon Kindle, and so is what I know about fishing southwest Florida. That's an in-depth book about fishing the waters from Pine Island Sound south to the 10,000 Isles. Book three is on the way. Take a kid fishing, an adult's guide for introducing youngsters to the world of angling. I've got the manuscript for the uh, book form in my hands. I'm doing some checks and that'll go back to the publisher and we're getting there. We're, it's The end is in sight. Episode 55, The Keys to Happiness. <laughs> I struggle with the title. Anyway, what are the keys to happiness? Living in the Florida Keys. Uh, play on words. See, I'm always, yeah, I know I'm really creative and all that stuff. Anyway, living in the Florida Keys. Yes, that's right. This past week's been a, a, a mix of emotions for me, mostly good. I'm still praying for my friends and family who are just now beginning the recovery from Hurricane Ian in Southwest Florida. I, it's a mess. It's a mess. My brother basically lost his house. And most everything in it. Uh, Mama is still up in North Carolina. I'm not sure when she's due back. I guess once they get the power on back in her area. Daughter's doing fine. Um, as a matter of fact, she's back at work. Um, so, you know, but my friends, my guide friends are, it's it's very bad. Some, some had their boats, lived inland enough, had boats on trailers where the boats were usable. But of course, there's no customers. And there won't be for quite some time because there's no place to stay. Uh, you know, most of the customers that we worked with on the Southwest Coast stayed on Sanibel Island or Fort Myers Beach. That was the two hot spots. Captiva, of course, was involved in that. And so was uh, like going down to Bonita. But anyway, so there's that's not happening right now. However, the guys are working. They're using their boats as a barge system, basically, to get people back and forth to the islands, equipment, things like that. Uh, at this point, just an update for those that are interested, Sanibel Bridge is still not open. Uh, they've closed off the gap down by the toll booth. I saw that this morning, and they're working on the rest of the causeway to get Sanibel reconnected to the mainland. Uh, Pine Island is now connected to the mainland through Matt Lachey, through the Matt Lachey Bridge. They, re they didn't repair it. They, um, well, I guess you'd call it a repair. They put a lot of dirt down to get things out there. Um... And on Fort Myers Beach, people have been permitted to the beach, but unfortunately, the big Carlos Pass Bridge, which is the one to the south, of, is now closed. Um, they It sank. <laughs> well, <laughs> not all the way. Let me rephrase that. It sank a little bit from one bit of bridge to the other, so there's a large, uh, you know, like a foot difference between pavement, and obviously, it's impassable. Uh, the North Bridge is open. Pat Matanzas Pass Bridge is open. And as of yesterday, they started letting some of the residents back which I started seeing a lot of posts on Facebook and they were like, just, I think, you know, seeing it on TV or watching videos is one thing in person. From what I understand, everyone says it's just, you just can't imagine. I, and I get that. I've seen, I've seen what I call regular hurricanes. This is way beyond regular. So, so that's the update. That's what's going on. It'll be a while before everybody recovers from that. And I'll cover it each and every time just to give you little updates for those of you that like to come down and fish in the area, or you'd like to go over and fish from other places here in Florida. It'll be a while. Yeah. Um, we just spent uh, a weekend in, in Key West. First time I've been back uh, since, it's actually been probably closer to two years. It was right after they opened up the highway to, to let you back in Key West after COVID. Well, not after COVID, but during, when COVID got better, easier, whatever, people got vaccinated. Uh, we were able to go south and we did. And that was a quick trip. We, we went down from Fort Lauderdale, took a quick look and then went right back home. Um, so this was a weekend for us. This was our anniversary weekend, our anniversary. I'm recording this on Monday, so the anniversary is tomorrow, Tuesday. So we went down, and we really had a great time. Um, I'll give you a rundown, because those of you who want to go to the Keys, um, and especially Key West. First of all, Key West escaped major damage. They had quite a bit of it on the southern edge of the island, the island that, the side that faces Cuba, the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, quite a bit of water came up in the streets. Couple, couple feet in some places on Lower Duval. Um, a lot of trees, brush, debris, things like that. Uh, when you're driving out to the Keys on uh, US-1, on the left side of the road as you're heading south, 
Uh, it's really Southwest, but I won't get too picky about that. <laughs> anyway, um, there were boats literally up against the highway. There were large cruisers, sailboats, all kinds of stuff that had gotten washed out of the Atlantic Ocean right up against the highway. Uh, but the road is open. Uh, they have cleaned up the sand in most places. Uh, Duval Street is obviously wide open. Uh, but the southern side of the island looks a little messier than the northern side of the island. The northern side, the north end of Duval, it faces the Gulf of Mexico, and they got they got rain and water, but they didn't get all the um, the hardcore winds, the tropical hardcore winds, and, and broken trees and all that stuff like they did down on the on the southern end of the island. And keep in mind, the island's only two by four. It's it's two miles uh, from south to north, and then across it's four miles. So it's it's not, Key West is not that big. Um, the resorts seem to be doing well. Uh, I didn't notice any major closures. There was, there were some things like, for example, we had dinner at Louie's backyard, which is our, that is our place as I like to call it. Um, Joan and I basically had our first lunch there, a first dinner of any kind there. And so we always go back and there's a really cool little bar that hangs out into the Atlantic ocean called the after deck. And it's a great place to sit and watch the sunset. Um, again, you're, you're facing more South than, than than uh, on that deck, then you are facing west, but you can still see the sun go down and moon rises, which is kind of neat. Uh, but anyway, um, the after deck is closed. Uh, it had enough damage where they need to do some repairs to the dock and the structure underneath. However, the restaurant's open. Louis' backyard is open. Um, famous among Jimmy Buffett parrot heads. Um, uh, there's a song, which is very appropriate, trying to reason with hurricane season, in which he sings about... Um, I don't know, waking up, being lazy. I think he's hung over. Uh, he's, he's tired of the fact that the, you know, the gale force winds are starting to show up. So he stumbles next door to the bar. Well, it happens to be Louis's backyard because Buffett lived next door to it in an apartment with a couple of friends. So stumbling next door to the bar happened to be Louis's. And that put Louis's on the map for a lot of Buffett people. Um, I just enjoy it because the food is excellent. Uh, beyond excellent. It's a, it's a white tablecloth place. It's fancy, it's nice, it's expensive, and it's worth every penny of it. Uh, so if you get a chance to go to Key West, get yourself a cab and tell them you want to go to Louis because it's real hard to find by bicycle or moped on your own. I'm not sure if that's on purpose or not, <laughs> but but the cabbie will get you there without any problems and get you back home too. Um, so anyway, that's you know, be sure to check it out. It's a great place. We checked out the surrounding areas. As a matter of fact, the cab driver, uh, Jennifer, she was great. Uh, she's with the Pink Cab, I call it, the Pink Cab Company. Um, she took us through the back road so we could kind of get a good look at what had happened on that end of the island. Because, you know, on the main street, you don't notice much because it's cleaned up immediately. But on the back roads is where you can tell how much wind and stuff blew. So I will say this, Key West slash the Florida Keys was very lucky in this one. They, they really were. Unfortunately, it went past up into the Gulf and Southwest Florida was very unlucky. And that's the way hurricanes work sometimes. Um, so preparedness is best and we were um we let's see we basically we did the duval crawl kind of after we ate we went up to the green parrot hung out at the green parrot um one drink there's enough and then we headed over to the bull i love going to the bull because in my opinion they have the best music on the entire island when it comes to just good old-fashioned rock and roll and playing music and the band was great three i'm sorry i don't know the name <laughs> I don't. Three piece band, uh, guitar player, bass player, and drummer, and they were on fire. They were really terrific. Uh, and then we basically we stumbled back to the room instead of stumbling back to the bar. Um, and then we just laid around on on uh, Saturday. It was just like it was just layback day. It was like meh, you know, we don't feel like doing anything. And um, we wound up on um, Sunday. We had a special invitation from the creator, owner, president, man in charge of the um, uh, Key West Butterfly and Nature Conservancy. And Janelle and I have visited there quite often. It's one of our favorite places in Key West. We're both butterfly nuts, we admit it. We're both you know plant, outdoorsy type people. And this is probably one of the best butterfly exhibits or, or, or nature conservancies that you can run into. It's, it's not real big, but it's, it's perfect, I guess is the best way to put it. Well, the owner, George Fernandez, invited us for a special sitting. Um, they have a couple of pink flamingos there, um, Rhett and Scarlet. <laughs> Figure out the names. It's good. You can, you know, look it up, but it's named after something. 
And Rhett and Scarlett are, are um, they're just, they're quite the pair, uh, male and female, uh, paired for life, we understand. And they like to come up and give you kisses and pull on your hair and basically, and they hug you. They'll put their neck around you. It's, it is the wildest thing you've ever experienced. Um, they do this for public. Um, I think it's uh, one day, I think it's on Fridays. I don't have all that written down, but um, you can go online and look up the Key West Butterfly Nature Conservancy. And they have a great Facebook page and they have an Instagram page, but they almost always post pictures or something from the event. And uh, every week somebody, you know, they'll have a group, I think it's a group of six. Uh, you have to call in advance for reservations, and you, you'll sit in this little uh, kind of uh, pagoda-type area with, with seating, and the and the flamingos show up first thing in the morning, and you get attention. <laughs> it's, it's, I have to tell you, it's fabulous. It's really, really fun. I'd highly recommend it if you're there. Uh, we got the grand tour of the facility. The only time we've been there, of course, is, you know, you go through the butterfly garden. Um, you see the, the birds and uh, flamingos, and then you come back out through the gift shop, and then you leave. Oh, well, George was kind enough to give us a complete history. He also walked us through all the displays, which are fabulous, about the different butterflies, in particular some of the ones that Janelle and I are most interested in, the ones that are that are here in Florida uh, that we see quite a bit, the zebra wings, monarchs, atalas, things like that, and life cycles. Uh, and one of the most fascinating things for me, which I didn't know much about, was the, the huge difference between moths and, and butterflies, of which they've done extensive studies of both. Um, so anyway, I really enjoyed it and I would highly recommend you check it out again. That's the Key West Butterfly and Nature Conservancy, um, on the South end of Duval street in Key West. We went to dinner. The second big dinner we went to was at one Duval. We had never been there. Neither one of us. We'd heard about it. It's been there for a while. It's in the pier house, which is up on the, on the, again, on the very North end of the Island. What a fabulous meal. Great service. Food was delicious. More intimate than most any place I've been on the Keys. Um, the dining area was small, but they had a huge outside patio. It was kind of warm and humid that, that you know the other evening, so we decided to eat inside. Um, but the view is gorgeous because you're looking right out at Key West Harbor, and it's yeah, I mean, it's really something. And I was very very pleased with the food. We'll go back for sure. Oddly enough, it's in the pier, pier house. I, I don't know how I never wound up there, um, or how we never wound up there because in that that same unit, the pier house, is one of the most famous little bars in all of Key West called the Chart Room. And the Chart Room, as the story goes, is where Jimmy Buffett, back in the 70s, when he showed up there with uh, friends and whatever, um, the first place they went was to the Chart House. And the first place he had a beer in Key West was in the Chart House. And so, again, this, gives, this goes full circle back to this whole parrot head thing. Uh, pre parrot head thing, I should say. Um, it it just I just find it really unusual. It's like the two places that I enjoy now the most, the the one Duval and uh, down south at Louis's backyard, have some weird connection to to Mr. Buffett. So anyway, pretty cool. Um, let's see, what else did we do? We walked, we t shirt shopped, we went to um, uh, we went to the uh, fly shop, we went checked out books. We just had we had a really great time. It was a, a lot of fun, and then we mostly kicked back. You know, and that's what you do in Key West. It's like my activity level is way down compared to what it was when I was in my twenties. <laughs> so I'm not doing I'm not crawling from one end of Duval to the other without without serious consequences. So I don't I try not to do that anymore. I am, hope, hopefully don't. Next trip down, we'll take the bicycles with us. I would recommend this highly to those of you that visit by car. Um, if you come down and you have the wherewithal to bring bicycles with you, by all means, do it. Um, if, you, if you're driving Jeep, truck, car, and you've got a rack on the back and you've got a pair of bicycles, bring them. It makes living and, living and riding in Key West much easier. You can park the car in one spot. A lot of times your resort will have a parking place, but then you can get around on the bikes because, again, the, the whole island is two by four. And most of it is the two mile part that you're going to that you're going to venture into to sight, see and see stuff. So one day we had we had lunch over in what used to be turtle called Turtle Crawls. Crawls changed name. Of course, I can't think of what it was off the top of my head. 
for the life of me, I can't remember. <laughs> Turtle Call's Caribbean restaurant, I think is what they call it now. Great burgers. I know that's ironic because most places in Key West, I'm going to visit for seafood. But in all honesty, they make the best burger in the whole place. But it's located at the old Turtle Crawl's location in Key West, which is near the Eat It Raw Bar and in, in that area. Um, again, up near, near Schooner's Wharf, which happens to be one of our favorite bars in Key West. So... Again, I like being next to the water. I mean, if I'm going to be in the Keys and I'm going to eat, I would much prefer to see a visual of the sea than be inland at one of the restaurants. Although, I'm not. I'm, there's one I won't poo-poo. <laughs> Mangoes. I love going to Mangoes, which is right. It's on the southern end of Duval Street. That's another great hangout. Let's talk fishing a little bit. I haven't spoken about fishing in a while. Hurricanes have kind of gotten in the way, to say the least. I will say this. There's not much fishing on the West Coast happening that I'm aware of. My, my guys are not fishing. Let's just put it that way. Um, water quality in the Gulf is not good off of that coast. Now, that's not, I'm not saying it's poisonous or that fish are dying. That's not happening. It's just the fish won't feed. It is so milky and so churned up that the fish and bait have left. They've basically gone probably out into the Gulf of Mexico. Some areas are starting to clear inside of Estero Bay and inside of Pine Island Sound and Mount Lachey Pass are starting to clear up. The only problem is that if you if you live in the area and you want to fish those areas, you're going to have to be careful on your own. There's a lot of debris. If there's cars. <laughs> there's refrigerators. There's uh, uh, cars and trucks are in the middle of Estero Bay. There is a house. The house was down near Hickory Creek and it came loose. I don't know how. I, I, there's no way in the world to explain this other than 12 to 15 feet of water will lift the house off of its foundation and it floated it up into Estero Bay and it's sitting in the middle of Estero Bay. So there you go. Um, but I haven't gotten any real fishing reports and I probably won't for a while. People are way too busy cleaning up right now. So that's that's the way it is. And in a, in, a, in a kind of a blessing, this is a slow time for those folks. Uh, I know when I fished there, when you got into October, September, October, and early November, there really wasn't a lot going on until you got to Thanksgiving, and then things just take off. So uh, hopefully I'll get a report or two, and I'll, and I'll put it out there. When I was eating uh, lunch that day at the Turtle Crawls area, uh, the, the uh, uh, boats were coming in from off the reefs, and the Yellowtail Hall was big. Um, every, there was one captain out there. I think he must've cleaned fish for a half hour to 45 minutes. So I know he got an absolutely righteous catch, catch of yellowtail and, um, sizable fish. Um, I haven't heard a lot about, um, tarpon other than an early morning tarpon, nothing about daytime fishing for tarpon. Uh, we're on king tides here. If you're not familiar with what that is, it's an unusually high tide because of the big moon that we're having right now. The hunter's moon uh, was last night, yesterday. And of course, on either side of that moon, you're going to have a, a lot of moving water and a lot of high water. Even your low tides are high, if that makes sense. Um, and these fish, the problem with that is, is that when you're in the back country looking for snook, reds, tarpon, and things like that, there's so much water, they can travel to places that you would never think of looking. It's not like when you have a decent low tide going to high, um, where the fish are, are funnel, or even a high going to low, where the fish funnel into an area and stay there, and they've been there time after time. When you have king tides, it's almost impossible to predict where they're going to go. Obviously, they're following food. But they have a tremendous amount of water to move around in, so it makes it very difficult. Um, and you'll find that uh, that down here in the Keys, the offshore fishing suddenly takes off, and, and that's where the guys are going. They're going out to the reefs. They're working these reefs. The weather has been very pleasant after the hurricane passed. Uh, the seas calmed down nicely. We only had one breezy day a couple of days ago. Like today, it's almost calm. Uh, five mile an hour winds, five to ten. It's just and it's gorgeous. Our temperatures are finally dropping a little bit, and that makes a, a big difference in catching. Um, as the, uh, as the water's cool, the fish get more active days are getting shorter. They get more active. I mean, there's just a lot of things that start happening in October that makes, I think October is one of my favorite months to get out there. I'm going to put the kayak back in the water here shortly and go venture into my back country area where I've been finding snapper and see if I can't find a redfish or two. Uh, the back country has reported quite a few tarpon. Uh, these are what I like to call resident tarpon or juveniles, juniors, you know, whatever the term is. Uh, fun size is what a lot of guys refer to them as because they're not as big a pain in the butt as the big ones. Um, and I mean that in a good way. Everybody's got a big tarpon on the bucket list. Okay, I, I get it. Anything over 160 pounds, man, you, you have to have one. But once you've done one, you're probably not terribly interested in doing it again because uh, they'll beat you up. That's all there is to it. Um, although there are those that are addicted. I understand that. 
but I love the ones that are just under 50 pounds. I love the ones that are in that 35, 45 pound range and they are just a blast. They eat and they run, jump, do all the things that big tarpon do, but are much more manageable, especially from a kayak. Um, I, the reports have been good. Inshore reports have been really, really good on them. Not so much the back country. When I say inshore, I'm talking about the inner island areas along the uh, ocean side of the islands here, especially up here in Key Largo. And then down in Isla Morada on the inside, inside of um, Everglades National Park boundary. So on the other side of the intercoastal, when you get into those near islands, um, it, they've been very, very good. Early morning has been the bite, so I've been told. Two different guys I talked to said there's no point in doing afternoon, that the bite is really, I, they didn't mention evening, and I know some guys will do that, but that the early morning has been absolutely best, and it lasts until about 9 or 10 o'clock, and then they they sort of just turn off. Uh, flies, uh, people down here, it's, it's, this, is, this is fly fishing country down here, and the reason for that, of course, is the clear water. Um, and the ability to sight fish, unlike a lot of other areas on the west coast of Florida, where, where I spend a lot of time fishing. Um, the flies have been small, uh, little bitty things. Um, uh, it's, it's just hard to imagine. Just imagine a fly that's no more than an inch and a half long, sometimes an inch long. That's been working best. Um, throwing the great big streamers or the great big long clousers is just not the ticket right now. Um, something much, much smaller is what these, what these fish are looking for. On our drive back up from Key West, uh, we did the leisurely drive is what I call it. Um, we made a stop at two of the state parks on the ocean side just to check them out and see um, how they were and how they were faring. We stopped at Curry State Park first. Wait, is that the right name? See, I've done it again. Curry Hammock State Park. <laughs> I'll get it out. It's on the Gulf. It's a Gulf, right? It's on the ocean side. Um, just after Marathon. Yeah, about 10 miles after, 10 miles this side, Key Largo side of the Seven Mile Bridge. So it's just out of Marathon. It was open, which is, that's what we were kind of looking at, just seeing what was going on. It was open. It was, that's a great little park. I have never been in there before. It has an enormous campsite uh, secured uh, camper area on the right for like RVs and stuff like that. You'd have to get a reservation. Um, but it's got a gate, which an, a gate inside the gate. So when you get into the park, you actually have a security gate to get into, which is nice. So you have, you have some privacy. The, the left-hand road as you turn left goes into the public area. There's a beach, a really nice beach. Actually, it's surprisingly big beach. Um, is waiting. Uh, you could, you could actually fly fish there. The bottom is hard. It's a hard sand. It looks to me like it would certainly have, um, some bones moving by and perhaps surely kudas and things like that. It has kayak, uh, checkouts where you can check out a kayak and there's a, they have tandem and single kayaks where you can take uh, out with a friend. I mean, it's really nice. It was a great little park, not real big, but certainly, uh, good enough, uh, I'm I, actually I'm going to go back with the kayaks. What I'm going to do, um, but that was pretty cool. That's the first time I've been in there. A little further up the road, we stopped at Long Key State Park, and and we wanted to do that because there has been controversy back and forth. That park, every single storm takes a pounding, and the name says it all. It's on Long Key, and it is long. It's it's a skinny park. It runs all the way down the beachfront with a single road. So it, you can go left or right. The left-hand side, last time we were there, the left was open. They were working on the right because it had taken hurricane damage from Irma. Well, Ian came along and did it again. So the park was completely closed when we were there yesterday. So you want to check. You want to call these parks before you make a decision on like a day visit or maybe an overnight with a tent, stuff like that. You definitely want to call to find out exactly what's going on. But for all intents and purposes, Long Key is closed. Long Key is very nice, though, when it's open. It's a very expansive, long road with the, on beachfront, right on the Atlantic Ocean. Um, good camping area, good place to fish, good place to take a kayak to kayak if you like ocean kayaking, stuff like that. But uh, unfortunately, it's, for the time being, it's closed. And then from that point, we just headed our way on back up here to Key Largo after a nice long weekend. I got to tell you, I love being in the Keys. I'm going to highly recommend it to you. The hurricane is, has clearly, clearly focused uh, hurricane preparedness on myself and Janelle. We are, we, we've always been that way. I mean, we've been through, you've you heard my last two podcasts. I've been through a bunch of them and so has she. Um, but this one was 
really different than the fact that it, the utter devastation of water finally happened. You know, they have long been talking about tidal surge, and most of the hurricanes we've been through would have a three-foot surge, something like that, which might get up over the beach into the first road, like the highway or whatever, and maybe do a little damage to the lower floor of a house, but uh, nothing like completely wash the house away. And we had that. I mean, we literally had a tidal wave without calling it a tidal wave. Uh, my friend Barry... Captain Barry Cuda, you can look him up. Uh, they did a news story on him. They did a news story on his survival of, of the hurricane, uh, which popped out. I think it came out after my last podcast, so I don't think I don't think I talked about it. If I did, I'm sorry I'm being redundant. Barry was in his house. He was on Spring Creek, which is on the backside of Estero Bay. So we're talking several miles from the Gulf of Mexico. Water came into Estero Bay, came up to his house, came in the creek, flooded his entire first floor. He swam to a neighbor's house, uh, which had a upper deck and a second floor. He climbed over the, now get this, he climbed over the railing that runs around the upper deck of the house. That's where the water was. And then got inside the house to let, to let him in. And he's looking out with a video uh, recorder. And you can see the water now lapping over the porch that he swam over to to climb up on top of. Very, he thought it was over. He actually said his goodbyes in a video. Very, very moving and very, holy cow, this is really going to happen. As the way he said it, he, he said, I, I, I think this might not turn out exactly the way I want it to turn out. Fortunately, it did. He survived. Um, a lot of people didn't. I think the count now is at 130. That's statewide. I think it's 80, 84 in Southwest Florida right now. That's terrible. It's, just, it's tragic. It really is. It's going to be a long, long time before they straighten it out. So anyway, anything you can do to help if you're in the area, um, they, they'll take any kind of donation. You can you can go online to the Red Cross and make donations. You can go online to Captains for Clean Water. They're carding stuff. They're actually hiring other captains to move product back and forth to people that can't get access. You have to remember now, some of these islands that these people live on don't have bridges and never have. You know, you get up to uh, North Captiva, uh, the lower end of Kay Acosta Island, Yusepa. There are islands out there that, that have people on them that they're completely cut off from anything right now, including news um, and communication. It wiped out the cell towers. So um, it's it's been it's been quite a mess. The good news is up until recently, the weather has been good. The rains have started to come back. We had a front go through. And um, so that's put them in a particular pickle. Weather. Oh, boy. <laughs> it got hot again. But but here's the good news. I heard the weather guys say we're in for a break um, at the end of this week. So I'm doing this on Monday, my podcast usually, but they do come out on Tuesdays. And he was talking about Friday or Saturday. We're actually going to have a huge drop in humidity. Apparently you all, if you're listening to this up north or if anywhere north of like middle Florida, a cold front made it to you, uh, especially up around um, the uh, Georgia-Florida border. And it's and uh, and I saw 38 degrees in some areas up in in the middle, still like Washington D.C. places like that. I saw 38 this morning. Well, that drier air is coming this way. That's going to be a blast if you fish. I am not going to kid you. One thing I'll tell you right now, I learned over the years of spent as a charter fisherman in the back country. It is just it does not get any better than the first real cold front and well maybe a little better on the second one and maybe a little better on the third one <laughs> but the first one is just like oh not only does it feel good to you it feels good to the fish our water cools off rapidly because it's not real deep um, especially in the back country and um, the water turns over if there's a breeze so you, you get that immediate cool down it stirs the bait and it makes the fish just go nuts. So if you're in the area or you, or you haven't been fishing and you're thinking, man, I really want to get out there, this coming weekend would probably be the time to do it. Before I get off of here, I want to tell you something. Let's see. I have been invited to a book fair. This is by this is actually put on by the publisher who published both, all, well, will be all three of my books. Uh, it's coming up on October the 29th at the Oakland Park Library. Uh, in Oakland Park, Florida. That is a little town. Oakland Park's just north of Fort Lauderdale proper. So in other words, uh, yeah, Fort Lauderdale proper. So um, October 29th from, I believe it's 10 in the morning until 5 in the afternoon. There will be a 
presentation for you hopeful writers. There's a presentation from 10 to 11 o'clock on publishing, how you get the publisher's attention, how to, but they'll even talk about self-publishing if you're daring enough. <laughs> I wasn't, <laughs> but anyway, um, it, they're going to have all kinds. There will be a whole series of authors from my publisher there. That's Middle River Press. I think there are 30 of us that will be there uh, representing our, representing theirs and our books. Um, I will not have the new book there. Uh, it will not be available yet. We're working on it. We'll get it out. I'll have information about it there. And I will have copies of my two existing books, my uh, Bridge to Paradise and What I Know About Fishing Southwest Florida will be there for signed copies. So if you're in the vicinity, if you're located in the Fort Lauderdale area or the, or the East Coast area, uh, pop in. That's Again, that's October 29th, Oakland Park Library, uh, from 10 to 5 o'clock. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you taking the time to tune in. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell a friend and leave a review. My podcast is scheduled for each and every Tuesday. Catch Outdoors is presented by the Waypoint Podcast Network. It's available on Waypoint and by many of your favorite podcast providers. Facebook page is Catch Outdoors. The website is waypointtv.com and catchoutdoors.com. Until next time, get outdoors and enjoy.